Only the first slide is dark. You may have noticed, I guess astronomers like dark backgrounds <laughs> on our slides. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, so this talk, is this on? It is on, OK. Um, this talk will be focused on how we go from observations of different molecules and disks uh, to what those abundances are and what they mean for the planets forming out of, out of these systems. And as you've heard over and over, and you'll continue to hear in this talk, um, ALMA really has been a game changer in that it's given us the sensitivity to detect many of these molecules and disks where we could never detect them before, including for the first time organics. Um, but as well, it has this amazing spatial resolution, given that the, tele the dishes of, these, uh, of this array are spread over an area um, up to 16 kilometers wide. So that gives us fantastic resolution in these systems. So to motivate the talk, um, maybe this will work. Yay, okay, I might have to just click. Um, so to motivate this talk, the, the, the key um, goal here is we wanna understand how the compositions of, of disks get incorporated into uh, forming young planets. So how does this carbon, oxygen, nitrogen get incorporated um, in, into planets? Now, Ted already showed this figure. Um, I think this is gonna work, maybe. But I just have to show it again because it's so, so incredible. So we're in this amazing era where we're not only we, oh, point there, 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 I'll replay it. We're in this amazing era where we can not only, you know, we've not only detected many exoplanets, but we can also uh, image exoplanets and even see them orbiting host stars. So this is a very close by system, HR 8799. Uh, and these, it's a, I think, 20 million year old system. So the planets are, they're a little bit more massive than Jupiter, but they're very young and bright. And that's why we can make these images of them. But the more amazing thing to me uh, about, about the system is that uh, they were a or we were able to, um, this wonderful paper by Bonif Bonifoy and, and Levy, uh, it was extract information about the abundances of the individual planets. So here are spectra taken of each of, of the sources, Bs over here, C, uh, D, and E. And through the, this abundance retrieval, they were able to even extract information about the carbon to oxygen ratio um, in, in each of the companions. And essentially, um, the, the inner planets, this D and E system, have very low C over O ratios, essentially very little carbon, though there is still oxygen present. That's the difficulty of ratios, right? Um, and then, of course, B and C, these outer planets here, are fairly carbon rich, where this one's a C to O ratio of almost one. The solar value is closer to uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. So how does this, um, we want to know where this comes from. Um, how does this get imprinted from a disk? That's working, okay. Um, and so here's just a cartoon where, uh, showing that if you assume a planet forms via what's called the core accretion process, where you start off by collecting the solid material, the rocks and the ice, uh, into a core that eventually gets sufficiently massive that it can accrete gas from the local disk. Uh, this uh, naturally results in a different composition between the core which is getting you know, the silicates we, uh, Ted was talking about, um, as well as the, the, any icy species like water, CO2, et cetera. Um, that will go into the solid phase, while the envelope will be whatever is left behind. A lot of molecular hydrogen, of course, a lot of helium. Uh, but if you form you know, your gas giant pretty far out, and there's very little water left in the gas because it's ice, uh, you might have a very oxygen poor atmosphere, as, as Ted alluded to. So chemically speaking, um, if we focus over here on the left-hand panel, uh, the general chemical structure of a disk looks something like this. You have your central star that's irradiating the disk. These young stars are extremely UV bright, not because they're uh, emitting UV from their photospheres, but because they're creating material that's crashing onto the surface that creates a, sh a shock that emits UV photons. That emission um, can shine on the disk, dissociate lots of molecules, and so you end up with this ionized surface. If you get a little bit deeper into the disk, eventually molecules can start to survive and you end up with a, a molecular layer. This is not completely radiation poor. The radiation uh, from UV and X-rays can still reach this layer and, and uh, do a lot of damage and power a lot of chemistry. If you get deep enough into the disk, you get into this, this icy region where um, the, the temperatures are so low that the grains uh, that molecules that hit the surfaces of dust grains tend to stick and they form icy mantles. And the composition of the ice in the midplane uh, will tend to, will, will change as you move with distance from the star. So you end up starting out with some amount of water ice freezing out, for example, initially. And then as you get further away from the star, you can freeze out more volatile things like CO and, and then molecular nitrogen. 
Now, in addition to all the, the chemistry that occurs uh, that you heard about this morning, um, all of the gas phase, the ice phase chemistry occurring, there's also a lot of physical factors that can change the composition of protoplanetary disks. So the young star, um, this, this whole environment is extremely active. So you can have winds from the young star or from the disk um, uh, removing material that can particularly remove the light species. Uh, you could have transport through the disk where different uh, reservoirs of material from the outer disk, the inner disk to, can be mixed together and foster a different a chemical outcome. You could have uh, the solids as they're growing on the way from being you know, these tiny micron sized dust grains to larger protoplanets and, and even gas giant, or the cores of gas giants, th those solids will have their own dynamical evolution that can decouple and we think actually we can observe it decoupling from the gas. Uh, and so that will tend to redistribute any of the volatiles that have fo uh, formed icy mantles, hitched along for the ride, and, and are moved around in the disk as well. So how do we observe uh, these, uh, these systems? So there's a number of different wavelength regimes. As you've seen uh, in previous talks and in this talk, we'll be focusing here on the submillimeter. But you can look at the inner sort of few AU, the terrestrial planet forming region, we call it, using near infrared lines. Um, so robirational emission. You can go a little bit further out and uh, to the mid and the far infrared and probe sort of tens of AU scales um, in their, in their uh, molecular content. And then much further out for the bulk of the disk, it's a log scale, uh, is the submillimeter. Of course, Alma is actually getting us down to sort of 10 AU scales where we can even see the, the uh, submillimeter emission even very close to the star. So um, what do these look like? This is just a, a, a sample of uh, images of mo molecules around young stars. The star is in the center of every image. And so this is a host of different species, C18O, C2H, H13CO+, CN, N2H+, DCO+. Uh, some of them look more round, and that's because the disk is looking at us more face on, while some are more elongated and ellipse. That's just an inclination effect. But the main takeaway is that you see lots of different types of structure. We see double ring systems. We see centrally peaked uh, with a secondary ring, we see single ring systems, uh, we see a lot of different things, and in some cases even uh, non-axisymmetric features. And what's interesting is that you might say, well, maybe there's just a giant gap in the middle. Maybe planets are clearing that away. But um, if you look at this one, this one, and this one, those are all the same system. You can kind of tell because they're all very circular, right? And, that, uh, and the C18 you know, it's extremely centrally peaked, while it's only showing up as a ring in these other two lines. And so that's telling you that's not a deficit of gas. It's telling you there's active chemistry going on uh, and that the profiles for different molecules and um, even different rotational lines can, can be different. And so this is important information that can tell us a lot about, uh, about the, the chemistry going on in a disk. Now, um, just to point out, oh, here we go. These observations are all taking a single line of 13CO, this one's 13CO, the two to one rotational transition. And it's integrating all the emission at all velocity. So that's, we call these moment, one, uh, moment zero maps. Uh, so Alma, uh, as Susanna uh, mentioned, is wonderful at creating not only beautiful maps in the sky, resolved maps, but also gives us full spectral information. And so we can see at every given location the velocity structure of the disk. And so if your disk emission looks something like this, where here's your midplane where the planets are forming, and your emission is coming from surf a surface, which we expect, given that's where the molecules are, 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 are existing, um, where it's ice below and um, uh, dissociated above, we can overlay um, what, how the motion of the gas should look if it's rotating in just Keplerian rotation around the star. And so this is the material coming towards us, and that's the material going away from us. And so essentially, if you make an image of a disk at any given frequency, you can get full three-dimensional information of where that emission is coming from. And so essentially, if you pull out, let's say, take this light blue color, you'll see a, for a double forked structure, so the near side of the disk, the far side of the disk, near, and then far hiding in this plot here. And what's amazing is with Alma that this is possible to actually start to see, kind of, <laughs> I promise. Um, so this is, was very early data. This was actually science verification data with Alma. This wasn't part of someone's program. This was community data to, get, uh, to give to the, to the community um, to learn how to use Alma in its early state. These data were you know, very complex. 
And so this is a disk HD 163296. It's around a more massive host star. Um, but all of these little boxes you see here are just different slices in velocity space. And if I just take one of them, if you squint, you can see not only this horseshoe on the front, but there's a mission back here and back here. Uh, if I just help guide your eye a little bit, um, we can see the top surface of CO, the back surface of CO. And then essentially what this, this is telling us is we're able to see where the CO is in the gas and where CO is starting to freeze out uh, by, by the absence of the CO emission. Now, after the, talk er, or after the question earlier about um, extraction techniques, I wanted to add just two quick slides. So, so ALMA is an interferometer. Uh, to get this, the resolution of a Hubble-like image with a radio telescope, you have to build a radio telescope that's something like 10 kilometers in size. And so instead of doing that, which would be extremely expensive, uh, would be it, you instead build lots of telescopes like ALMA, so 66 ante an antenna, and spread them out over a large area. And the maximum size or maximum length between the, the baselines gives you a resolution. And so together, all of these different antenna um, talk together uh, and together synthesize a, an image of the sky. Unfortunately, because it's not a single dish, you can't just directly point ALMA and make an image. You have to do some extraction techniques. Uh, but, let's see, it's not going to work, oh, here we go. Um, but um, essentially, you can make extremely nice images if you spread your dishes out over a large area. This is an idealized interferometer at the North Pole, it would be a terrible idea, but it's an easy, uh, it's an easy um, source case. So if you wait long enough, you can actually w let the sky rotate, or the earth rotate and the sky, you know, point at different directions, and you can fill out essentially what's called your aperture plane. So this is filling out the UV plane with many different baseline observations. So you can essentially get the image quality of a, of a whole telescope by just letting the Earth rotate. And so this is um, related to this extraction of weak signals. So the, the neat thing about observing disks, as, as opposed to more messy objects like long filaments or molecular clouds, is that their rotation is very simple. It's very much Keplerian in nature. And so you have here, um, an example, this was actually made by a graduate student, Ian Chikala, who's now a postdoc at Stanford. And this is a long video, I'm not gonna show the whole thing, but it shows what a disc looks like on the sky if you just take it and you turn it towards you, or you turn it face on or edge on. And it will re repeat back and forth, it will change the mass of the star, it will change a lot of things. But essentially, it's a very well-behaved emission. We know uh, when gravity works and the gas orbits um, uh, it, around the star in, in very Keplerian motion. And so what's actually pretty cool is that ALMA has, is, is actually sensitive to looking for phase changes in the data. Essentially, as the motion, as the gas is flipping from one side of your image to the other, from red to blue shifted, ALMA is actually really good at finding those sorts of weak signals in the data that we can't actually image. If you tried to make an image um, of, of, of a very weak signal, you wouldn't see anything. But if it's just below the noise, ALMA can still see that there's a disk there. And this was an amazing um, work done by a, another graduate student, Ryan Loomis, where he essentially took a template of what a Keplerian disk should look like. He created, he Fourier, took the Fourier transform and basically created a, this is not all the visibilities of ALMA. That's a, a much larger number than can fit on the screen. But he, he created a cartoon version of it where this is what the disk would look like to ALMA. And then if you just take your long broadband spectrum that, uh, that uh, ALMA can get, and you slide, sorry, slide through this template through the data, most of the time, you're not gonna see any cross-correlation. We'll just see lots and lots of noise. But if there happens to be a line hiding in your data, just a few sigma below the noise, it will pop right out and it, you get a, a signal in the impulse response spectrum. And so this, is, this can be done in a single, you know, op, op, typical 100 gigabyte ALMA uh, data set within a matter of, I think, minutes. And so this is an amazing way to just filter through your data and see what you have. The hard thing is, is that this is actually not a spectrum. And so you can't take this at the end of the day and say, this is, you know, this is how bright this line is, and then I go model it. Sadly, um, oh, oh, sorry, yeah, of course. So um, yeah, so this is not a spectrum. Uh, yeah, I, can, I feel like I'm really loud, so I'm sorry. I, like I'm, I feel like I'm shouting. OK, the speakers are good here, I guess. Um, so, uh, so yeah, um, so if you filter through what you expect a disk to look like in the Fourier plane, uh, you get an, a signal response whenever there's a line hiding in your noise. And yeah, this can be done in minutes, essentially. You can filter through massive quantities of data. You can actually just throw this, some, if you 
have lots of disk operations in the, archi in the ALMA archive, uh, you could just filter your entire data set and find all your detections. Of course, classifying them will be, you know, a uh, poor graduate student's job. So the reason that it's a, a challenge, though, to actually interpret this is because you can always think of a better template. You can, you can always find out, you know, if your template is worse, but you can never find the best template. You could use a template of a disk that's just purely Keplerian rotation. It could be a ring or multiple rings. And you could try infinite numbers of, of different distribu distributions of molecules. And you can always find something that is better, but you don't know if it's the best uh, template. This hasn't yet been applied to other environments. I think it should be tested. But so far, it works incredibly well for disks. OK, so um, do I have 10, 8 minutes? OK. So, all right, so how do we actually go from an image that looks something like this uh, to an actual distribution of molecules in the sky? There are a few different ways we can actually go about doing this. Um, I'll just cover very briefly the three sort of main ways in the literature that uh, folks can, uh, that folks use typically. So the first is direct extraction from the data. The second is a forward modeling approach using parametric models. And the third is forward modeling uh, using detailed models. So if you have like a, a spectrum of your source, this is a, a seminal paper by uh, Anne Dutre. This was, if you plot molecules versus time detected in disks, this is the single largest bump even after the Alma era. Uh, it was the first you know, major effort to go uh, search for molecular emission in disks. And so essentially what was observed are, are spectra. And so there was no images at the time. And so to get, to convert this to an actual number density or number column density of CO or 12 CO or 13 CO, um, you, ha you, you would have to assume something. And so the easiest thing to do is you just take the flux directly and you relate it to um, the, the, the number density in your beam. So this is essentially the way you do it. Uh, so if you have an observation of a line intensity, you can relate it back to the number, um, the column density of a given molecule along your line of sight uh, through just a few simple equations. You have to assume a couple of things, though. You have to assume that Every photon from every molecule that's decaying is actually getting to you, so you have to assume it's optically thin. And you also have to assume an excitation temperature. Uh, but through those two assumptions, um, you can basically convert an on-sky intensity to a number density or a column density of molecules. And this is a really quick and dirty way of uh, actually converting um, observations to abundances. And it's, it's very convenient, especially if you're trying to do relative abundances and you assume your molecules are um, coming from the same gas. But we know that these disks are extremely complex. They have very large temperature gradients going from tens of Kelvin to hundreds of Kelvin, if not thousands. So a single temperature doesn't always work. Another thing you can actually do to try and take, uh, to try and extract information about abundances in the disk is you can just take the next level of complexity and assume a parametric model. So this allows you to say, okay, I expect my molecules to show up in the surface of the disk since down here they're probably frozen and up here they're probably dissociated. And so um, this also requires some temperature assumptions. You have to assume what your radial distribution of molecules is, but it doesn't require any complex chemical modeling. And so it can be very quick. You can mon mark up, uh, ah, you can MCMC it. <laughs> and so you can even get you know, uncertainties on your, on your estimates for different column densities. It's a very flexible uh, means to extract information from your data. Um, but the problem is it can be sometimes not unique. So here's just two different examples of a warm emitting layer, or you could assume it comes from a single cold emitting layer and have it be something like 20 Kelvin gas. So to actually put, do this in practice, you have to assume something about the column density with distance from the star. If you chose something like CO, for, for example, you would have the CO column density be highest close to the star. That's just a natural consequence of the evolution, the gas evolution of disks. Uh, and you might even put a break in there where you expect CO to freeze out. And so, um, or you could, if you have a different molecule uh, that tends to appear when CO is destroyed, you might have the opposite profile. But you basically have to define some kind of structure with distance from the star. This was applied by Karin Oberg to understand the formaldehyde chemistry of a disk to see whether it was associated with uh, CO freezeouts. We think essentially the path to forming methanol uh, starts through forming formaldehyde, and formaldehyde, we think, is at least uh, in some part contributed to by the freeze out of CO ice and hydrogenation processes. And so essentially the, the, the point here is that you can sort of choose any sort of distribution you want in your disk, but it turns out that there are many degenerate options. You could have a curved surface, you know, that works pretty well, but you could also instead just have a second component here. And so 
parametric models have those limitations, unfortunately. The third option is you can just go uh, kitchen sink and do full forward models, including chemistry. This is, a, this is usually requires lots and lots of parameters, and it's only really best applied when you know a lot about your source. The star, um, the star's properties, its luminosity, the disk, the gas and dust densities, uh, and the chemistry. Um, what kind of reaction network do you use? Are the rates um, in your reaction network well measured or not for the relevant uh, reactions? Do you include gas phase or do you include grain surface chemistry, et cetera? And so there's a lot of different options. But this tends to actually be a pretty good way of getting full 2D dimensional maps of abundances in disks, especially when you know stuff, when you, when you know your source very, very well. And, it, and the most important thing is that by having a full chemical model, you can actually say something about why you have 13CO in the surface, what reactions are actually driving the, the chemistry in the disk, whereas a parametric model just says where it's happening, and then you can maybe say, well, models show, other models show that, you know, this is the main driver. Uh, this is just an overview slide, and so actually this is the, the movie Ted showed of, of how we do, uh, one, just for one uh, modeling case, how we actually do this process. You start off with some disk structure that could have a giant ring or multiple rings. Uh, you assume some gas density profile on top of that. You irradiate it, bombard it with photons from ultraviolet and uh, X-ray uh, uh, radiation from the star. You calculate the chemistry. You can output. Um, you can calculate the ex uh, emergent radiation from the lines of interest or the molecules of interest. And then finally, you want to compare to um, observations in, in either the visibility space, the image space, uh, or spectra. And ideally, you want to couple all of these different processes. So you probably already figured out that disks are not as chemically well studied as clouds. And part of that is because a disk is about 1% the mass of the sun, maybe a few percent the mass of the sun. So it's a very small compared to a molecular cloud, which can be many solar masses of gas. Um, they're a bit warmer. That helps a little bit. Uh, but still, you're measuring a very tiny amount of mass of gas. So this was a recent compilation. Brett McGuire just put out a, a, an overview paper of interstellar molecules, disk molecules, and I think actually planetary molecules. And this was the table uh, made for disks. And it's the same sort of table you've seen before, two atoms, three atoms, four atoms, five atoms, six. This is the level of complexity we, we've gotten to, with, as we heard from Catherine Walsh. And so the, the challenge here has been that disks are very low mass. They're not very bright, so it's hard to do. ALMA has been transformative. We, have, we now can, most of these species, so these three species all detected for the first time with ALMA, C3H2 imaged for the first time, or detected for the first time with ALMA, and many of these species have been, um, have been greatly improved by, by these images. So since I'm running out of time, I might uh, go a little bit further in advance, but I just want to point out, you can see all my slides, <laughs> that um, one, of the, one of the fascinating things that sort of come out, um, as Ted alluded to, is that we're able to start extracting carbon to oxygen measurements um, in exoplanets, but now also in disks. That was helped a lot by um, beautiful ALMA observations of um, C2H. Turns out that C2H, the abundance of C2H, is extremely sensitive to the assumed carbon to oxygen ratio in the disk. And so um, the interpretation is essentially that in, this, in the disk phase, during sorry, during the first few million years of evolution, uh, you're taking a lot of the grains that are coated in water ice, and they tend to grow together. And once they're large enough, they, they start to gravitationally settle out and eventually start to drift inward as they feel a headwind against the gas. And so that tr preferentially is taking a lot of oxygen out of the surface and, and the upper layers of the disk, leaving a lot of carbon, which naturally becomes uh, as a, a hydrocarbon factory, as, as Fujun phrased it. And so we were able to actually apply this um, to a, a nearby disk. And I'm not going to get into the, the details, but essentially uh, using models over here, um, you can vary the amount of C, to, C over O uh, in, your mo in your simulations and essentially predict how C2H will respond. Just focus on the top column here. And just to point out, the, this top line is about a factor of a C to O ratio of 1.8, and this is 0.9. So a change in the factor of two in the C over O ratio results in a change of about 100 in the column density. So these are very observable effects. And so we were able to actually constrain C over O as well as N over O in this disk for the first time. So ask me in the, the panel later if you're curious. So the next step is, you know, how do we take this 
and actually start measuring carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, and other disks. We now have three disks where there are C2H observations. Uh, this is the disk TW Hydra. It's actually pretty old. There's an intermediate age disk called DM Tau. It shows two rings in C2H, so it's a little bit of different morphology. And then this third disk, I am Loop, that we that we most recently modeled, has a has a beautiful C2H detection, but it's much fainter than the others. And these are, you know, not too different in distance. It's not a distance effect in this case. So it seems like there's a, a time evolution from centrally peaked to centrally peaked with a ring, and then a larger ring at, at later times. And so this is maybe telling us that the C over O ratio is actually evolving uh, spatially and uh, with time uh, as the disk is aging. And maybe that will change if a planet forms early or late what C over O ratio it inherits. And so if I, two minutes, oh, I was gonna wrap up even sooner, okay. Um, if, if I may, you know, do some wild, you know, brief speculation. <laughs> um, this is that, on the background, is that planetary system that I showed you at the beginning where the planets were orbiting the host star. And these were the C over O ratios derived. And if I actually plot on top of it this TW Hydra disk, it's an eight, eight-ish, ten-ish million year old disk. Astronomer, astronomers will argue about ages for hours. You know, don't start them. But uh, um, it's around, you know, it's an older protoplanetary disk, but it's still fairly gas-rich. And so this over, overlaid is that ring of C, C2H. And um, as, I, as I mentioned, this molecule is extremely sensitive to the C over O ratio. And completely by chance, if you put them on the exact same spatial scales, it turns out that the E and D pair that have a very low C over O ratio show up right in the middle of this gap of the, the TW Hydra ring. And so, and then the outermost planets fall in the, the very bright region where the, the hydrocarbon abundance is quite high. Of course, this is entirely speculative and it's the level of, you know, you'd present it in a talk, you wouldn't put it in a paper. But it's just kind of fun that maybe this isn't so crazy to start trying to even measure radial profiles in um, carbon to oxygen ratios to link to actual planetary systems uh, currently uh, being observed. And so I'll just wrap up here. Um, we're in this wonderful discovery era of, of ALMA uh, where we're able to map and, and uh, map molecular emission as well as detect these very trace species, tra detect organics for the first time. Uh, where get, there are different techniques of increasing uh, levels of sophistication to actually extract information in, uh, from um, observations of disks. Uh, but, you know, for 3D maps have been amazing since it gives you actually a direct picture of where the molecule is in the disk in, in, in three-dimensional space, you know, RZ and phi. Uh, we're starting to see evidence that the C over O ratio is deviating from solar, of, from 0.5. And so we're seeing uh, vol volatile oxygen and carbon uh, being removed from the surface of the disk. Uh, we're seeing, I didn't get to talk about it much, but there seem to be different depletion patterns. When we have the data in, in, uh, of multiple lines towards one source, uh, we see a great amount of oxygen depletion, so for IM loop, a factor of 100, a factor of 20 depletion for carbon uh, from the upper surface, but nitrogen seems to actually be remaining uh, in the gas, and that's measured by HCN. And then the last thing I just want to point out is that the chemistry is not purely the, the gas and grain surface reactions that are going on within the disk, it seems like the physical structure of the disk um, is directly influencing the, the, the overall chemistry. It seems like the ices are being transported and taking volatiles with them and redistributing them as a function of time um, and space throughout the disk. And so this is going to be very important to study across many disks at different ages uh, to see, you know, is this an important factor? And so uh, with that, uh, thank you for your attention. You can oh, ask me later. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, what connections do you need between the disk observations and chemical studies in the lab to be able to, oh, yeah. to move this forward? So, especially, so most of what we observe in the upper surface of the disk is in this UV dominated region. So, I think that like the non thermal uh, desorption and processing mechanisms of ices are extremely uh, important. I think it, Catherine mentioned that a bunch of the, the holdups or the, the, the stopping blocks is that we see things like methanol and methyl cyanide in the gas phase in disks at very, very low temperatures where they should be ice and they're, they're being non-thermally desorbed. And it's actually extremely hard to pre, uh, explain that given that you know, a lot of experiments show that 
methanol and methyl cyanide fragment when you radiate, radiate the ice with, um, uh, with UV light. So, you know, how that, that's an important thing that needs to be solved. Any other questions? Um, so the, the thing with C2H and its connection with the carbon to oxygen ratio, um, what's the reaction specifically that gets you that result? So it's through C3, C3H plus, there's a number of reactions, yep, okay. but it's, it's all through, well, it's CH3 plus is involved, C3H plus um, is a host of reactions it, It's involved. gas phase. It's, oh, it's all gas phase. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great question. All right, let's thank Wilson again.